Hello to everybody. I think we, we better get started because it is 11 o'clock. And first of all, I would like to say a very warm welcome to, to all the LMC participants who decided to make this trip to Tartu. And I also want to say a warm welcome to all the students who, who have found time in the, I know that the exams are going on here, so not many of you can be present, but still those who have come, uh, a very warm welcome to you. This is the second time when the Leonard Murray Conference travels out from Tallinn. The first time was 2016 when we visited Narva, and this became a very successful event. And, uh, and as Estonia is celebrating its 100th year's birthday this year, then uh, we decided that we should take the participants to, to the cradle of Estonian history and, and culture, and this is Tartu. And Tartu is, of course, the university city and it's the intellectual capital. So I, uh, I wish you a very successful and interesting debate. Uh, and uh, I will give a word now to representative of Tartu University. Dear conference participants, uh, actually very many people are following uh, us through the video link, so uh, this is quite typical recently that, uh, that uh, the hall is not filled with so much people, but on the behalf of the University of Tartu, I welcome you here in the hall of the main building of the University. Uh, this is one of the rooms with largest brain power in Estonia throughout the history. It has evidenced many historical events in restless times. Many times the university has started again to build up its capacity from almost zero. Recently, Times Higher Education ranking system has recognized University of Tartu as the best university in New Europe and we are proud of that. We wish to develop and contribute more and more. The university has six core values. Research-based activities provide us with a way of thinking that entails critical analysis, a search for connections, and the pursuit of truth, and that is targeted at solving problems. The academic freedom and autonomy of the university help us creatively and devotedly implement our mission. Openness to new ideas with relying on our traditions contribute to positive changes in the world around us. Cooperation between people, institutions and research are for the benefit of the society in the best and most responsible manner. A human-centered approach values the people who work and study at the university and create the best working and learning environment. And the responsibility realizes the social impact of actions and omissions. Our words and actions are filled with responsibility for the past, present and future. Let the ideas and thoughts produced here today become a part of the history of the university Tartu, Estonia, and all the world. I wish all of you a wonderful conference and continuing sunshine. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Um, thank you to you all. I'm Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. And straight at me. Um, and we have, I think, for you quite a wonderful panel today. We have a big, wide-ranging set of topics. The world is in turmoil, that we all understand. I wouldn't, would wonder, looking outside, just how much turmoil there is. Um, lots of things to talk about um, across regions. Um, I'm always fascinated. I, I was lucky enough um, to interview Leonard Mary when he was president of Estonia. Um, and I admired him quite a lot. Um, and I remember when I, I met him, we had the usual conversation, and then he asked me, this was before Estonia got into NATO, he asked me what I thought the United States would do if Russia reinvaded Estonia. And I said, well, Mr. President, honestly speaking, I don't think we'd do anything at all. 
we would just probably put on some sanctions. And he laughed. He said, yes, I think that's right. So times have changed. Now you have an Article 5 guarantee, even if we're not sure that we can defend Estonia, we would certainly make an effort. Um, and I think deterrence is working. Um, so turmoil here, tur turmoil next door, turmoil in China, India, North Korea, and in Washington, too, it should be said. Um, so um, I'm going to try to you know, be more of what the French would call an animator rather than a moderator. It always seems to me moderators tamp down debate and animators are supposed to inspire them. So, so that's what I'm going to try to do. And um, we do have a really good panel for you. I'm going to ask people to talk on topics of, of uh, expertise and interest to them for five or six minutes. I may ask them some questions. Then we will go to you so you can take advantage of the expertise arrayed in front of you. So um, I think we'll begin um, with Sandy Birchbau, who's an old friend, uh, done a lot of things, but former ambassador to Moscow, former NATO deputy secretary general. Sandy, over to you. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to kick off our discussion today, and uh, I think that Russia is probably the biggest of the many security challenges that have uh, thrown our world into turmoil, so I will give my thoughts on uh, how to deal with uh, Putin's Russia. Uh, relations between Russia and the West were declining even before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine four years ago, uh, but, but even then we still considered Russia to be a partner, a difficult one, but still a partner. Uh, but today's Russia is no longer interested in partnership, and with this year's uh, so-called elections guaranteeing at least six more years of Vladimir Putin, uh, relations are likely to remain very difficult for a long time to come. And I believe that given the nature of Putin's regime and its revisionist ambitions uh, in Europe and beyond, uh, we really need to prepare ourselves for a period of long-term strategic competition with Russia. And this is a view which is happily reflected in the uh, national security strategy of, uh, of the Trump administration, which I think President Trump has read. <laughs> and for those who say that uh, you know, we need to do business with Russia, uh, I would argue that there isn't all that much business to do. Uh, but I'll come back to that in a second. In, uh, in many ways, the Russian challenge today is more difficult than during the last decades of the Cold War. And certainly in the years following the peaceful uh, dissolution of the Soviet Empire. Because back in the 70s and 80s, we were able to uh, lower tensions, reduce conventional and nuclear arms, uh, and develop a common framework uh, for European security uh, based on the principles of the uh, Helsinki Final Act of 1975. And these principles were, uh, were taken up with great enthusiasm by uh, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, as we sought together to, to, to build a, uh, an integrated European security system from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok, as we said. And this included a strategic partnership between Russia and NATO. Uh, this even continued into the early 21st century with uh, Putin in his uh, first term and with Medvedev. And of course, all this time, both sides were steadily reducing their military forces in Europe. But today we're dealing with a Russia that wants to reassert its great power status again, and uh, a Russia that defines its interests almost exclusively in opposition to the West, and especially to the United States. Uh, Putin has openly called for a return to a divided Europe based on uh, spheres of influence, based on uh, a kind of re renewed Brezhnev doctrine of limited sovereignty for Russia's neighbors, a kind of uh, Yalta II, and, of course, he's shown a readiness to use force to change borders and block his neighbor's path uh, to NATO and the European Union. And I think the main driver in all this has been domestic politics, uh, not NATO enlargement or Western military encirclement, as Russia's narrative would have you believe. Uh, of course, Russia dislikes NATO and wants to weaken it, but Moscow's real fear is the encroachment of uh, Western ideas and values 
and their potential to contaminate Russia itself and ultimately undermine the Putin regime. So uh, basically what Putin is determined to do is to prevent the spread of color revolutions to Russia and, and to this end he's determined to destroy any Western oriented alternative that could rise up in Russia's neighborhood such as the uh, Ukrainian Maidan and he wants to make his neighbors unstable and unattractive candidates for the EU and NATO. And of course this isn't enough, he also wants to uh, undermine and discredit Western democracy itself and that's the motivation for his uh, active measures against the United States and its allies. Of course part of this is, is, a, is the Russian military threat uh, and of course here in the Baltic states you feel that most uh, immediately with the potential for uh, a limited land grab that, which Russia could launch using some of the techniques it used in uh, Crimea and eastern Ukraine. So part of our strategy must be to continue bolstering our defense and deterrence posture uh, as NATO has been doing since 2014. Uh, and I'm pleased that at the upcoming uh, Brussels summit, uh, allies are likely to agree to additional measures to strengthen deterrence even further, including a number of US-inspired uh, initiatives to boost the readiness of allied forces uh, and their capacity to quickly reinforce the small uh, multinational battalions that are now stationed here. There'll also be other deliverables at the summit which will strengthen deterrence as well, including approval of a new NATO command structure. I would say that the Trump administration's uh, policy on NATO uh, has been largely positive and it's enjoyed broad congressional support despite the president's uh, statements that NATO is obsolete. Uh, I'd highlight in particular the increased funding for the European Deterrence Initiative and support for an increased uh, ground presence in Europe uh, which Congress is backing in the uh, draft of next year's National Defense Authorization Act. Now what NATO is doing is largely good news, but uh, the bigger challenge, which we haven't come to grips with, is how to deter and defeat Russia's political aggressiveness against our societies and our, against, against our democratic institutions. And equally important is how are we going to deny the Russians the hegemony that they seek in Eastern Europe as part of their vision of a new Yalta. Now in the former case, we have to do more to strengthen our own resilience against cyber attacks, disinformation, and interference in our elections. Uh, we're not going to get the Russians to stop these activities, but we can do, do more to reduce our own vulnerabilities, to uh, curb the misuse of social media, to uh, debunk Russian propaganda, and to expose uh, the techniques that they use to maintain plausible deniability. In the case of the countries most threatened by Moscow, especially Ukraine and Georgia, we need to continue to bolster their defense capabilities and their resilience against uh, cyber attacks even as we hold their feet to the fire uh, on reforms. And we have to look for more ways to impose real costs on Russia. Uh, this means a long-term U.S. and transatlantic strategy for sanctions, especially against Putin's power base, as well as steps to reduce Russian energy leverage and export revenue. Uh, the strategic objective in all of this is not just to blunt the Russian threats or punish Russia for its aggression, but over time to change Putin's calculus and encourage a de-escalation in Russian aggression and political warfare. But I don't think we're doing enough and we, we need to uh, uh, do more to forge a more robust, uh, united uh, front with our closest allies and partners uh, in Europe, which isn't easy to do when we're starting a trade war uh, by threatening secondary sanctions on uh, European companies doing business with Iran. And indeed, I know there's a lot of pessimism right now about uh, the increasing differences uh, between the United States and Europe on uh, a range of issues, uh, and a lot of talk about the U.S. abandoning its, uh, its traditional leadership role. But I would urge people not to over-dramatize the situation. Uh, yes, we're going to have to kind of compartmentalize, focus on those areas where we are still working together and try to protect them and strengthen that cooperation, and that includes our strategy on sanctions against Russia. And we should manage the, uh, the differences uh, uh, where, we, where, where necessary if, if those differences can't be easily overcome. 
But clearly, we need to uh, look to the long term. We're in a long term strategic uh, competition with Russia. Putin and his regime will continue to promote the narrative of a, of a Russia under siege, a Russia that's standing up to a hostile, Russophobic West. Uh, this siege mentality is, I think, going to remain in place because Putin needs an external enemy since he can't deliver anymore on prosperity or improved li living standards without uh, the fundamental reforms that he considers much too dangerous uh, for his regime. So what this boils down to is strategic patience, managing the competition, trying where we can to reduce the risks of direct conflict, both through deterrence and using Cold War tools like arms control, transparency, and confidence building measures, uh, but recognizing that Russia isn't particularly interested in doing much in this area. Uh, we should continue to stand up for the values and support what's left of civil society in Russia. And of course, we do already engage in a dialogue with Russia on a lot of issues, and we can try to cooperate with them on some, some issues where our interest, interests may overlap, such as North Korea. But I believe that uh, there's very few examples where we actually do have overlapping interests right now. And uh, uh, managing the competition rather than, than expecting a significant improvement in relations is probably the best that we can do, at least until Putin departs the scene, which uh, mm -hmm. sadly, unless uh, he's hit by lightning, I is know. at least uh, six, six more years and may, maybe longer if right. uh, the Constitution does get changed and he gets one more term. Thank you, Sandy, very, very much. Um, just, you began to raise it at, at the end, and obviously one can't look into um, the crystal ball, but um, presuming this is Putin's last term, it seems to be a fragile system, or it's a system based on, on one guy and his pals. Um, what, what do you see coming after Putin, I mean, is there something military? Is there, does the, I mean, who gets to pick? Would it be like Yeltsin and Chubayas picking Putin? How, how do you imagine it working and what do you imagine would emerge? Well, I think it, it is, in many ways, a fragile system. Putin, despite his uh, you know, machismo and bravado, was, I think, very insecure about the potential for popular backlash. And we've seen significant protests, uh, given that there's no other outlet for people to express their, their dissatisfaction. Uh, but I think that uh, he's likely to kind of orchestrate his own succession the way that Yeltsin did, the way that he did himself with Medvedev, uh, filling the gap when he, when he ran, uh, decided not to uh, change the Constitution after his second term, and likely to choose from among the uh, sort of the the Siloviki, the security forces people that, it, that he trusts the most. Although he's bringing in some younger technocrats uh, into into the system, so there is a certain rejuvenation going on, and it may not be uh, some of the people that are sort of the obvious candidates today. But I think he's going to put this off, for, since he doesn't want to turn himself into a lame duck, probably until late in his term. Uh, so unless there's some external shock uh, that destabilizes the system, you know, I think he'll manage to suppress opposition and dissent and, uh, and orchestrate a transition. Okay, great, thanks. Um, you, you also raised, I think, this, uh, the whole issue of secondary sanctions, of the difficulties the White House is having now with Europe. I mean, I used to joke to European friends, just be happy Trump isn't paying you any attention. You could call it, um, you could call it malign neglect, but now his attention is on Europe, um, and it looks like tomorrow there will be tariffs imposed on, quote, national security grounds against the European Union on, on steel and aluminum. Two of the big accomplishments of European diplomacy, the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran deal, have been undermined. So, Thomas, talk a bit about um, how you see it coming down and whether Europe really is in this moment of inflection um, where 
it actually begins to take seriously the idea of autonomy or even confrontation with the United States or whether it will pull back as it so often does in the face of the, of the American nuclear umbrella and the American dollar. Okay, thank you, Steve. Well, what a question to start the morning. Uh, autonomy, confrontation, or pullback. Um, I'm not part of the, the, the doomsayers who uh, declare and have been for the last 20 years the, the, the end of the West uh, and the complete downfall of the international order as we see it. Um, but I do think that what we're seeing is a serious crisis that is, a tra that is the beginning of a transformation and a beginning of a transformation towards a, um, a much weaker uh, multilateral system to a, what I would say, a multi-order uh, world uh, that has less power to integrate um, and that probably is more, uh, more rules-based uh, than it is liberal. Um, so we've, we've seen this, this crisis evolve. It has, uh, it has two components. It has external uh, um, threats to the order, uh, and it has internal threats. I think the internal threats, which is what you're alluding to within the family of Western nations, are uh, the more concerning ones. I think the, the external ones that uh, Sandy started uh, to, to talk about with regard to Russia can be managed, uh, but the internal ones are eroding uh, sort of the nature uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the West and need to be countered internally and need to be addressed and need to be solved. So the external threats, I, I would say, uh, is of course the rise of, uh, of authoritarianism, uh, in uh, around the world, not just uh, a, a more bullish uh, a Russia, but also China. I read a, 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 a number the other day that was hard to believe for me that in the early 1990s, authoritarian states uh, had a, a, a combined 13% of the economic output of the world. It's now at around 30%. Now a lot of that is China. A lot of that will be when you start moving uh, Turkey from one camp to the other. But I think it's a concerning number because it, it, it tells us that, uh, that authoritarian states are also delivering to their people. So there is an output legitimacy that they are uh, th th that they are um, that they are having. Um, I, I think that the idea that the uh, that there is competing elements of order, and I think it's very clear that the authoritarian countries want to integrate differently than the West. They, uh, they, while the multilateral system is based on on I'd call it uh, horizontal integration between equal states and partners. They want to integrate vertically, uh, which is power-based, uh, interest uh, zone-based, uh, creating client states and vassals rather than allies. Uh, I, I think we've, we know this. We, we've, we've been there before. The Cold War has actually shown that the existence of uh, of competing systems of orders can be dealt with. Uh, in fact, you would have to say that it contributed to the cohesion uh, of the West. In fact, the, the, uh, the post-war world order was built on, uh, uh, on the existence of a competing order that also had a uni universalist claim to it. Um, um, so I think we're, we're, we can deal with the fact that the that the, the order is, it will be not global but international, it will have a smaller reach, and it will be not as liberal but more rules-based, and that there will be competing, uh, com competing conceptions. And that the idea that we will have a sort of a one-world fantasy of a liberal world order that the Russians and the Chinese are eventually, as they're building middle classes, are going to si sign on to and become more of a participatory systems, I think that has proven to be a fantasy and we should not 
expect that to be any time in our lifetime uh, become a reality. So that's p uh, that to me is piece one of 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 that of the picture. But the other element, to me, the more concerning one, is uh, is the is the internal uh, uh, troubles that we're having inside of our um, of, of our. Uh, of our Western community, and that to me is the the challenge uh, by uh, by a renationalization and a uh, and a decreasing willingness uh, to integrate and cooperate uh, with each other. I think we've uh, we've been uh, in some sort of I mean there well let me start another way. Populism has two. Um, as part of the renationalization movement, has two competing uh, 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 trains or thoughts of explanation. One is an economic explanation. These are the left behinds of globalization uh, uh, that, that are now demanding their fair share in their, in their nation states. Uh, the competing uh, explanation is a cultural one, as you know, um, that, that folks uh, feel dislocated from globalization, inter in, including in their home countries and, and by migration and so forth. We all know these uh, explanations. What I would like to offer is a different uh, one, I would what I would call Western uh, liberal overreach. I think we have, um, um, since 1990, um, engaged in something that uh, is being called democratic uh, determinism. The thought that uh, enshrined in the Paris Charter that in, in the end we'll all, be, we'll all be liberal Democrats. And uh, it, it's sort of a teleological, quasi-religious belief that this would be the, the end state. And in the course of that, Folks have cut corners. We've built systems that today don't look stable, and it's not a surprise that people uh, in different countries revolt to them. Um, I would say the idea that you can have a global financial system without, that is self-balanced and doesn't have regulation, that's what led to the financial crisis. The idea that you have migration without borders, Schengen without external borders, that you have a currency without a political center, that the idea to have, def to have peace without defense, to have a human rights system that allows little lapses like Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, uh, uh, to have free trade without the idea that there's losers. So I think people are, uh, people are responding to, uh, to these shortcuts. Short, systemic shortcuts. So we're in a period, I think, we're, we're seeing a, a, a series of crises emanating from that. Uh, started with a financial crisis, a migration crisis, a security crisis. I think we're now in a trade crisis. Uh, and by the way, as when you read the paper, we're entering into a currency crisis r right as we speak here. So we have the overlay of different uh, sort of uh, uh, crisis of erosion in our system. Uh, and um, what I'm seeing since 2008 is a slow, I would say too slow, uh, attempt at reforming all of these systems and addressing all of these grievances. Uh, and the question is, uh, are they going to be fixed faster than the system is going to deteriorate? Uh, and so that the, the, sort of the additional, and that uh, sort of gets to, your, gets to your question, Steve, uh, um, uh, the American role in this, of course, is important. Um, um, from when we look at this from a Berlin perspective, uh, I, I think uh, uh, there is a sense that, that America is, uh, is leaving us, that it is uh, no longer a guardian of the, of the, of the post-war order as we know it, uh, that it is starting to integrate horizontal, uh, vertically rather than horizontally, uh, that we have a, 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 uh, a abandoning of, of, uh, of multilateral system, whether they be in non-proliferation, whether they be in climate, whether they be in trade, uh, and even uh, in, as, as Sandy alluded to, it's not very clear how that, how that will in the end play out with regard to NATO. Uh, so the idea that something is happening in the United States 
that is troublesome, that needs to be responded to. And if t by tomorrow uh, the, uh, the United States imposes trade sanctions on, on the EU, there will have to be a response. And the strategic challenge is that there will need to be a, 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 re a response to, uh, to this president and his erratic behavior. Um, that is in line with a long-term strategic interest in, uh, in, a, in the transatlantic relationship and the connection with the United States. And whether that can be done through, as Sandy Vershbo uh, uh, suggested, through compartmentalizing. So we take Russia because we agree on Russia, but that's kind of hard to do when uh, the, the United States uh, chooses uh, to not just to abandon but to violate the Iran agreement and impose what, what I would consider illegal secondary sanctions on European companies. That is going to be a very hard sell to our publics. So playing the long game requires a calibrated and responsible response to the current situation. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, part of what we've gone through is and one feels it here in a country like Estonia, where, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, in part because of Estonia's own efforts, there was this kind of period of great magical thinking, which you've described very, very well. Um, and I wonder if Europe's going through a bit the same thing about Donald Trump. This is what I wanted to ask you. There's this big debate in Germany. I don't know if it's ever going to be resolved, but is, you know, Trump a symptom of American decline, as China would see it, or is he an interlude? And how Europe responds depends a lot on how Europe answers that question. So what's, what's your sense? There, of course, there is a debate going on about that. Is what Trump uh, exhibits the new normal of American foreign policy? Or is it a sui generis type of, uh, of American foreign policy? And the, and the answer to that question is indeed uh, important for your, larger strategic, uh, for your larger strategic outlook. I happen to be of, uh, of believing that I'm looking at Trump as a more of a, more of a shallow phenomenon. I'm, I don't see uh, Roosevelt's New Deal in front of me in the form of Trumpism with a 30-year, 40-year horizon. I don't see Reaganism uh, 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 building here. Uh, um, I see trends in American society that he is a symptom of. Uh, an, an, an intervention fatigue, a globalization critique, a migration critique, uh, by the way, all things that only if you think that Europe is a stable island that has nothing to do with all of these things, then you can be believe that these are purely American, uh, uh, purely American um, tendencies. So what I believe that there, there, is, uh, there is challenges that we have jointly. The American response by, the, by way of the election of Donald Trump is the American response to it. Uh, but I don't think that that necessarily over the long term uh, will result in, in a very different assessment of these issues. So we're going to have to have deal with the migration issue on this continent as well. It's not necessarily a division point, a transatlantic division point. Right. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's always fascinated me, I was based in Southeast Asia for a time, and I often think when one sits in Europe, we forget about this crucial, enormous part of the world where economies are shifting, where demography is defining the future. And, and there is no question, it seems to me, that you, you, you know, if we still believe in the West and the rest, the rest is more important, more influential, and probably less obsessed with the West than it used to be. So we're lucky to have you, Harinder, to talk to us a bit about these two great countries, one a democracy, one increasingly authoritarian, India and China, and the kinds of um, challenges they pose to us. Please go ahead. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and you've talked about uh, the 
you know, decline of the West and rest. Uh, that's certainly not the way we look at it. Uh, the West is still increasingly interested in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. But what I'm going to do is to change the focus from Russia, which was called, you know, the biggest challenge. For us in Asia, it is China which is the biggest challenge. And this challenge is now increasing towards Europe as well, and the signs are very benign at the moment, but something which I think Europe is going to realize a few decades down the line. First of all, I mean, East Asia should not be ignored, uh, minus India, which is the second pop most populous country. Uh, East Asia has a population of 1.66 billion. It, that is 21.6 7% of global population. So look at the scales we are talking about. The three biggest economies are in, uh, you know, leave the US aside, uh, China, Japan, India, and now Indonesia. The biggest global economies are in East Asia. East Asia also accounts for uh, more than 33% of global trade. And China's trade alone with the ASEAN countries uh, or with East Asia is at 46% of China's total trade. So the scale, when we talk of the scale of population and the economies, so I think we cannot ignore this region. And what is happening over here is the fact that um, there's a great deal of power play uh, between the United States and China to contain China, to curb China's aggressive designs. But China is too firmly entrenched because China always refers to the United States as an outside power. And a country like India, which has emerged, you know, the US wants it to play the role of a so-called balancer to balance China's rise. And China always kind of reaches out. Is, you want it here? Is that better? Yeah. Fine, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so China, you know, so the United States, uh, sorry, China always reaches out. Like this. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Uh, so China wants us to uh, accept the fact that the United States is an outside power. You have to keep reminding China that the U.S. has been there since uh, World War II, when China was, you know, and China continues to survive and exist today because of the U.S. role during World War II. So it's a very interesting power play which is happening over here. And uh, there are two or three things which stand out. Uh, one is, uh, you know, China's biggest, China has emerged not only as the biggest uh, challenge in Asia for Asian countries. And another interesting development is Russia pivoting towards China. The Russia-China, uh, uh, you know, friendship which is developing by leaps and bounds, it is no longer an economic uh, friendship. Uh, you know, it's no longer the Shanghai-St. Petersburg economic corridor. It is increasingly in the realm of military hardware. And the, uh, the missiles which uh, China might, uh, sorry, Russia might sell to China. And not just China. Through China, Russia is increasingly involved with Pakistan militarily. Uh, it may have been limited right now to three, the sale of three uh, uh, helicopters for... Uh, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism operations, but China and, uh, sorry, Russia and Pakistan did engage in military exercises in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which caused a great deal of concern amongst India. And Russia sees this, you know, and this has come soon after uh, India was named the major defense partner by the United States. So you can understand, you know, so Russia is trying to signal to India and this brings this whole question of China and uh, India relations, which have always been very uh, stormy, though we do have a border talks mechanism going on with China. China is also our largest, uh, you know, uh, after the United, uh, is our largest trading partner, followed by the United States. Uh, the U.S. talks of China or, you know, as a Pacific power, and a great deal of U.S. activities vis-a-vis -vis China are concentrated in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, it feels very nice to hear that the Asia-Pacific is increasingly being called the Indo-Pacific. But 
uh, when you do a realistic assessment, and more recently, you know, we've had the quad mechanism being revived, the quad of 2007-2008. Uh, on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit, uh, uh, there was at the joint secretary, at the assistant secretary level, you had the quad talks. And um, this has caused a great deal of concern amongst China as well. Uh, what you, uh, uh, you uh, re uh, referred to China as being an authoritarian state, yes. Uh, Xi Jinping's uh, 19th Party Congress, he has named, soon after he has named himself as leader for life. So he is going to be like Chairman Mao, and you'll have a Chairman Xi. So he looks at all these trappings to strengthen his position, uh, not just within China, but also do some power play and projections uh, outwardly, because he has to show that this great China, and China has more recently been trying to show that it seeks to replace the U.S. as the biggest uh, global power. Uh, so China would eventually want to achieve, and uh, the psychological thing with the smaller powers in East Asia is that the U.S., I think this is what you refer to, that the U.S. is abandoning you. So this feeling is not confined only to Europe, but in East Asia as well, there is a feeling that the U.S. is abandoning and uh, uh, is losing interest in uh, the Indo-Pacific. And uh, also, it is abandoning multilateral systems, especially when Trump uh, walked out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And of course, now he says that he would be willing to join. Uh, so he's a contradictory, unpredictable president, which the United States has. So how this evolves is something which India watches as China continues to gain in strength in the region. Now, when it comes to China uh, and the regional powers, everyone has realized that the, neither the US hubs or spoke policy nor the offshore balancing is working anymore. So what needs to be realized, I think the alternative is to recognize the centrality of ASEAN. This is Association of Southeast Asian Nations, a conglomeration of 10 countries. And ASEAN's centrality to East Asian security needs to be understood. And unfortunately, ASEAN is a house divided amongst itself. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, okay. Keep going, but. Is it okay? Yeah, but just okay. a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so ASEAN's centrality needs to be uh, maintained. And this comes up because when the U.S. is looking at Pacific uh, systems, um, the ASEAN countries, each one, for them, the biggest trading partner is China. So there is a contradictory uh, contradiction over there between balancing their interests within, uh, with the U.S. and with China. When it comes to India, we face a similar problem because we've had a very major land border standoff last summer on the Dokalam Plateau. And India is very vulnerable in certain areas, and China claims, and not only claims, it occupies a lot of territory, Indian territory. And we cannot, I mean, our own leaders cannot visit those regions. And that takes me to the question of, you know, like, what is a sustainable method for managing China's rise? The U.S. talked about it, that make China a responsible stakeholder. This was something in 2007, 2008, Bob Zelik. But uh, China, over the years, instead of becoming more responsible, has become only more assertive, more aggressive. And uh, what would the U.S. do? Would, uh, you, you only started off with, uh, would the U.S. come to Estonia's aid if Russia attacked? Uh, would the U.S. come to India's aid if China attacked us and did another 1962 on our land borders? And this is what creates a real tricky question of balancing priorities for India between China and the United States. So I think I'll stop here for now and then. That's great, thank you. Because one of the things that, that, you know, I think fascinates er everyone is Deng Xiaoping used to say that China should keep its ambitions hidden, that it needed to grow while keeping the rest of the world calm and stable. Xi Jinping's thrown that out the window, you know, with great China and the China dream. And there's been a lot of, you know, talk about transition in world power because clearly Chinese economy is going to dwarf the United States eventually. I was talking to a friend the other day who was saying, well, when the transition between 
the UK and the US happened, Great Britain. Great Britain was at least clever enough to just get out of the way. I don't think the United States is going to be that generous with China. Um, how much does India worry about being caught somehow in the middle of that? Well, that's an interesting question. It's not just India, because when Obama went to China in 2009, and the whole body language was seen as being very servile towards uh, Hu Jintao at that time. And there was also talk of a G2, which the United States says that, no, it was not G2, and it was the media which played up. But there were concerns even in uh, Japan. And similarly, when uh, even with Trump, um, you know, given the uh, interdependence between the U.S. and Chinese economy, uh, there is great concern that, uh, you know, the other countries, the other economies might become irrelevant when it comes to the core economic interests. And I think each of us needs to really balance our dependence. Uh, you know, we, uh, so India is uh, actually in a very tricky situation because its two largest trading partners are China and the United States. And uh, with China, we have a huge trade deficit. With U.S., it's the other way around. The U.S. has a trade deficit. So I think, and the U.S. is now trying to, the bilateral in investment treaty has not happened, but it is now trying to push forward with the free trade agreement with India. So I think um, India needs to uh, do some smart act and thinking on its part. And the feeling within India is that uh, Trump is a mercurial president. As long as, you know, India keeps signing the checks and for military equipment through the foreign military sales route, and India is in dire need of uh, military equipment, a lot of other tricky issues would not come up. But, and also, uh, I think there's been a great deal of interest by the Pentagon, very high profile visits to India by officials, um, and they have been trying to talk about fast-tracking the DTTI, the Defense Trade and Technical uh, Initiative. So I think uh, we are comfortably placed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. With China, there is a trust deficit, but we still need to e engage with them economically because there is a feeling that China need, you know, uh, India needs to allow China an economic stake within the country in areas which are not critically or strategically important. So maybe in infrastructure, because China uh, feels that Japan has been given too much of uh, infrastructure development projects in India, and why not China? So there is a feeling that uh, you know the new crop of uh, leaders and um, uh, the bureaucracy, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that we need to open up certain sectors to Chinese investment and to Chinese, you know, like road building and highways, etc. So I think because of the sheer size of our market, we are comfortably placed. But we do have internal challenges. Great. Thank you. One thing I would, of course, always think of with Trump, he hates trade deficits. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this is a good segue to Peter, because one of the big fronts we have going, really two, are the nuclear issues in North Korea, where China is playing a, a very important role and also in, in Trump's pulling out of the Iran deal. So um, Peter from the Heritage Foundation, find a way of talking about both, both yeah. things. Thank you. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Um, when I think about U.S.-North uh, Korean relations, which have been somewhat remarkable recently, I'm reminded of uh, what they say about the weather in Denver, Colorado, uh, which is that if you don't like it now, just wait five minutes, it'll change. And uh, if anybody's ever been to Denver, which is this uh, famous American city known for its skiing, where the Great Plains meet the Rocky Mountains, it, you actually can experience that, and I have, where I've driven from the airport to the mountains and seen sunshine, rain, sleet, and snow in the same 20-mile trip. So that's how North Korean relations have been uh, really, uh, recently, and they've really been quite remarkable when you think about it, the significant changes we, we've seen. North Korea is important uh, to the United States and perhaps globally. I, I realize you probably don't think about it as much in this part of the world as, as we do in the United States. Uh, but of course, we're dealing with a frozen conflict. Uh, many people don't realize that the, the Korean 
conflict is, is frozen. It's been that way since 1953. It's just an armistice. There's never been a final peace treaty uh, concluded between, between the parties, which was the UN and the United States on one side and North Korea and uh, China on the other. Um, so there's a, and there's a tremendous conventional threat there. 60% uh, of North Korea's million-man army is positioned within 60, 100 kilometers of the misnamed demilitarized zone, which is the, probably the most militarized line of division in the, in the world today. So there's the potential there for a, a significant military action as well. I mean, South Korea is no slouch either. I mean, people talk about the United States as a significant military power. I mean, we only have 30,000 forces on the peninsula itself. Uh, where South Korea has a very large and capable uh, military uh, that would be thrown into the fray if North Korea were to try to reunite the peninsula under its, uh, under its control. Of course, there's the ballistic missile and nuclear threat. And this is something that not only uh, has the ability to reach out and touch the United States, but is also a peninsular as well as a regional, regional issue. Uh, North Korea is a significant, has a significant ballistic missile arsenal. Um, and it's believed to have a growing uh, nuclear capability as well. Um, the jury, I'm outside of government, so there are people inside of the government clearly know a lot more about this than I do, but it's, it's believed that North Korea may have the capability to explode a thermonuclear weapon, which is essentially a, a nuclear weapon which explodes another nuclear weapon, extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, there are gaps in their, in, in their capabilities um, in terms of accuracy, uh, in terms of uh, the ability of a warhead to survive intercontinental ballistic missile flight, the pressures, temperatures, vibrations, and then, then explode. Uh, but I think that um, we have to err on the side that they do have this, this uh, significant capability. And I think North Korea, from their negotiating stance, which I'll talk a little bit more about, believes they do, they do as well. Another thing a lot of people don't talk about in terms of North Korea's nuclear program is the proliferation potential. Uh, this is the spread of these weapons. Um, you, you remember, what is it, I guess 11 years ago when Israel took out a, a nuclear facility in Syria that was being built by the North Koreans. Uh, North Korea and Iran have this mysterious scientific and technological agreement uh, that I'm sure probably isn't uh, dealing with uh, you know, video games and things along this line. Neither one of them has much to sell commercially and is probably limited to the, the military sphere, which could include ballistic missiles and, and, nuclear, and nuclear weapons. Uh, so there's a concern about this, about North Korea being willing to uh, spread these weapons to other states, of, other states of concern. And of course, there's the human rights element, which I, I won't focus on today, but obviously 20-some million people live under a very repressive regime, which has a, a hundreds of thousands of people in, in uh, political camps. Uh, and widespread uh, uh, hunger, uh, hunger security issues. So the big issue today is, is June 12th going to happen? Uh, and I haven't looked at my, my iPhone in a few moments, so I'm not really sure what the latest is. And like the weather in Denver, uh, it, may, it may have changed. I know that Kim Chung, Ch Young Chol, uh, who is uh, Kim Jong-un's right-hand man, is in New York meeting with Mike Pompeo. I saw a few tweets about that, talking about what they had for dinner, uh, but not much else. Um, there's talk at this summit in Singapore if it's going to happen, which was off last week, it's now back on. Well, it's not really clear that it's back on. It's being considered. Uh, and a lot of the technical teams are, are working uh, in Singapore, U.S. and North Korean teams, and obviously at higher levels with the Secretary of State and, and uh, the, Korean, uh, the Korean general. Uh, but the question is, is there's a lot of things that could be addressed there. Uh, a peace treaty, which is one of the things I talked about, uh, is something that could be addressed. Reunification, I think, is something way down the road, but uh, obviously there's a lot of issues between North and South. I mean, this is a people that has been divided since the Korean War. Uh, many Korean families have family members on both sides of the DMZ and are rarely able to, rarely able to meet. But the big issue is denuclearization. What does North Korea really mean by this? And people who look at this issue are, are questioning that. And I don't know outside of government if we have a very good idea about that. Um, there have been some hints. Uh, North Korea's uh, senior nuclear negotiator, a guy named Kim Gae Gwan, who's been doing this for a long time. When I was a Capitol Hill uh, staffer and traveled to North Korea, he was the nuclear negotiator back in the 1990s. I have a feeling he had a lot to do with the agreed framework, which was the 1994 agreement under the Clinton administration. 
that when I joined the Bush administration, we found out North Korea was cheating on. But what do they mean by this? Um, the hints that we're seeing is that it's not unilateral disarmament on the part of North Korea. It's much broader. Uh, it's perhaps part of a global uh, denuclearization effort, that North Korea wants to be welcomed into uh, not only as a de facto, but a de jure nuclear power state, nuclear weapons state, uh, that they've achieved this. Uh, this is their, the beginning of their negotiations. They're not willing to just uh, denuclearize. And I guess I understand that from their perspective. Um, you know, being one of nine nuclear power weapon states, uh, there's a certain amount of prestige, uh, status, influence that comes along with this. Uh, it's also important to them from, I think, from a deterrent standpoint. If they really do think that the United States and South Korea were going to invade, this would certainly be um, something that they would be concerned about. The other issue is, is when they talk about a, a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula, which is something that North and South Korea agreed to in Singapore going back into 1992, um, how does that play with the United States? Are they talking about, uh, security analysts are worried that this may mean they want us to eliminate our ICBM force because it couldn't reach the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and of course, that would have an effect on our deterrent policies towards Russia and, and China or anybody else who becomes a, a nuclear threat to the, to the United States. Or is North Korea talking about a minimum credible deterrent, something that we saw in China in the 19, 1980s and 1990s with a small number of nuclear weapons that could um, affect a second strike if they were to be uh, hit with a, hit with a first, first strike. In other words, we'll draw them down, but we need to have some sort of nuclear arsenal. The U.S., of course, is, it wants what they call CVID, complete, verifiable, uh, irreversible dismantlement of their, of their, nuclear, of their nuclear program. Um, and as somebody who's looked at North Korea for, for a long time, I, I, I just don't see North Korea necessarily going that way. I'm trying to be hopeful, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm deeply skeptical. And I'm still mystified by the change we've seen in, in the last few months. I mean, it's been a 180 degree change in policy on the part of North Korea. I mean, from turning, you know, uh, Seoul and Washington into seas of fire, uh, to talking about allowing McDonald's or some other hamburger chain to open up in, in Pyongyang, returning American hostages, and even talking about uh, denuclearization. Um, it, most people, uh, if you've followed North Korea, you're aware that North Korea often cites when they say, uh, first of all, they've written into their constitution. Not that that can't be changed, but they've said we are a nuclear weapon state. They've, they've done this. They often cite uh, Iraq and uh, Libya as examples of why you really don't want to do that. Uh, maybe a little closer to home. I've never seen them do this, but they could also cite Ukraine and the problems they're having with Russia. Remember when Ukraine returned its weapons uh, to, uh, um, uh, to Russia at the end of the Cold War. I guess it was the Budapest Memorandum that, you know, that has been, been violated by Russia with Crimea and what's going on in eastern Ukraine. Uh, they could cite these sort of uh, these sort of things, and I think they think they need them for a deterrence, uh, deterrent, uh, a deterrent capability. So the big question is, what do they really uh, mean by this? Um, there are other issues here too. It's not just people talk about it's just you know the U.S. and and uh, and North Korea having some sort of summit meeting, which might be first in a series. I mean. This is a little bit different than we often see. I've worked on presidential visits in the past, and you're always working on all these deliverables. Uh, this is a little bit different. It's a different approach to it. I think uh, President Trump, and I can't speak for him, and I can't speak for the administration, nor do I have any privileged information, but I think he feels he can negotiate this. So in other words, he's going to be the, the, the key negotiator here. I don't think we're going to necessarily, we could have deliverables before June 12th, if it even happens, but this could be the first in a series. I mean, we've seen this in the past. I mean, you can remember Reagan uh, at Reykjavik with Gorbachev, and that didn't work out well, and then eventually we had the INF Treaty. Um, so, I mean, this could be the first in a, in a series in a series of, of meetings. But there are other major players. Uh, you know, South Korea is talking about, uh, President Moon is talking about showing up in Singapore, and perhaps after uh, the meeting between uh, North Korea and the United States, that he might join in this. I don't know, maybe they're hoping for a peace treaty or something along that line. Of course, North Korea has long said that South Korea is not a was not a signatory originally in 1953 to the armistice, uh, uh, but that's, that's a possibility. Uh, Japan, uh, and of course, South Korea's President Moon has significant political equities here uh, involved in that. His, his view towards North Korea is much more of an engager than an isolator, um, and um, he he's, has a different view, I think, than the United States has uh, towards South Korea, but has hewed very closely to the American hard line on, on North Korea and its nuclear program. Uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japan, 
uh, big issue is obviously challenged from a security perspective. Also, the uh, abductees, as they talk about, there are a number of cases where North Korea kidnapped Japanese citizens uh, for use is, uh, uh, in their intelligence directorates to train people to actually um, train their operatives to operate in Japan, teach them the language and culture of the Japanese to be returned as uh, intelligence operatives. Um, so he's got a lot. He's got a lot involved there. Russia, we've, we've talked a little bit about, obviously borders it. I'm not sure exactly where Russia comes down on North Korea, whether they would like to see it continue to be a problem for the United States or would like to see it resolved. I'm not clear on that myself. And of course, China. And many people don't realize that the American and Chinese interests on the Korean Peninsula don't align, in my view. Uh, they're not exactly the same. Uh, peace and stability, sure. Uh, but China, if we just have to think about 1950 and when American forces after they landed in Incheon and MacArthur drove north towards the Yalu, uh, the Chinese intervened with 200,000 quote-unquote volunteers. Uh, they don't necessarily want to see a united Korea, especially one that might be pro-U.S. They certainly don't necessarily want to see a united Korea where U.S. forces would be north of the 38th, 38th parallel. So their interests are not exactly the same, uh, same for us. Um, so I can Could, stop there but, on... Yeah, that's yeah. great. I mean, one of the things I've noticed in the famous coin that the White House was selling about the Singapore summit is that it didn't say June 21, it just said 2018. So we still have some time to go before the coin is invalid. Um, the point you made about China seems to make sense because it seems to me one reason North Korea would want to keep its nuclear deterrent is about China too. There's, there's a lot of history there. I mean, if you talk to the Koreans, they'll tell you that the Korean Peninsula has been invaded 900 to 1,000 times from China, whether that was the Mongols or others. So there is, there is concerns there. Uh, there is, there's history there. And as we've seen, Kim has been very much uh, shown his independence from the Chinese. In fact, Kim just met Xi recently right. for the first time. I mean, uh, it was, it was, it was a, a significant, uh, he's been in office for five or so years now, and it's the first time, which is really kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they've tried to show that independence. They don't necessarily want to be under a Chinese dominance. Um, and so Kim may be playing China a little bit through the United States as well. No, it's an interesting thing. I was talking the other day to Victor Cha, who might have been the ambassador to South Korea, except he said the wrong thing about Trump once, and so that was the end of it. But one of the things he had suggested, which I think was intriguing, and I'll just put it out there, is that you know, Trump wants to come away with something besides a second summit. And so Victor was suggesting that maybe the idea of a peace treaty would come more to the front. Everyone kind of assumes a peace treaty would come at, at the end of the process. But I mean, if one could do it, that might give North Korea more reassurance about its stability. Um, and um, China too. Well, this has been really helpful. I mean, we've covered quite a lot of territory, but I do, we have about 25 minutes left, and I would really love um, to bring all of you in, particularly um, any students that are here. You've got a, a lot of expertise, so if you would like to ask a question, and if anyone wants to ask a question, just let me know. Um, and um, raise your hand, we've got microphones, and um, please introduce yourself, if you don't mind, there. Okay, Quentin, in, introduce yourself. Uh, Quentin Peel from Chatham House. Um, I have two questions that I'd quite like to throw out. One, the Russia-China relationship, because we've talked Russia, we've talked China. How seriously do members of the panel take the, um, uh, the, the relationship that, that certainly Moscow would like to see as you're driving us into the arms of China, this is uh, um, very unwise because it's going to be a natural relationship for us to build up on, or would you belong to those cynics who say actually the reality is that China is probably a bigger threat to Russia in the long term than anybody else. So they will, this will be a much, much more cautious relationship. And the second question I'd like to put would be in a way that the Trump, the alienation of Europe from the US because of Trump, 
and the degree to which, for example, Trump pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal might be pushing Europe to repair or get closer to Russia and China. Um, uh, and we've seen it a little bit with Emmanuel Macron's trip to St. Petersburg. So in both those, are we actually tripping into some rather dangerous uh, directions? Great, thanks. I mean, why don't we try to deal with those first and then I'll take a bunch more. Sandy, do you want to try to answer the first question and, 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 and then and then Thomas maybe talk about about Europe. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that uh, looking in, at the, in the longer term perspective, the Russia-China relationship is more of a marriage of convenience than a, of a genuine strategic partnership. There's, I think Russia, a, after the sanctions were imposed, after the uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, tried their own pivot to Asia. Uh, and the Chinese were ready to oblige up to a point because they do uh, receive energy supplies from uh, Russia and uh, military equipment. But I think China is now the stronger of the partners and uh, is pursuing its own agenda in Central Asia with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and, and further afield. And I think ultimately uh, you know, they, they're using Russia, but they, they don't see Russia as uh, providing that much uh, additional uh, leverage for, for Chinese uh, global ambitions. Uh, but it would still be in, in our interest to try to uh, not, not to force them together as much as we've been doing. I think our, our on again, off again trade uh, war with China, I think today it's on again, yesterday it was off again, uh, it's like, like your weather in Denver, uh, is uh, you know, going to prolong this marriage of convenience and it's not to our strategic interest to, to see them getting closer together. Uh, as for your second point, uh, I think as, to the extent Europe is still trying to save the Iran deal and keep it in effect minus U.S. participation, that does lead them to engage more with Russia and China. But I, I fear that that effort is ultimately doomed because of U.S. secondary sanctions. And uh, what Europe really needs to start thinking about as much as it's outrageous and they're being coerced and you know, treated, treated badly. Uh, nevertheless, to sort of find some way to reconstruct the Iran deal. I mean, there were, there were negotiations going on at, a, at official level, which were, I'm told, within just a few sentences of agreement on measures to strengthen sanctions against ballistic missile proliferation, against uh, Iran's destabilizing behavior. And there was some formula in the works about uh, addressing breakout potential after the sunset clauses kicked in. So all the things that the Trump administration was worried about could have been agreed among at least the four of the, of the six original parties and then take this to Iran. So maybe that approach needs to be resurrected once the Iran deal is, is, is definitely defunct. And maybe Trump can be persuaded to rejoin a, an improved Iran deal, that which we could then get Russia and China to help sell to the Iranians. Uh, I don't see any Iran deal working without the U.S. ultimately being brought back on board. Okay. Go ahead. You want to talk about China? I think it's on. Just, just talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Russia-China relationship, you know, coming from India, uh, we do not view it as something which is against India. And I think the Russia-India relationship Stand, uh, stands on its own. But what has happened is, and also Russia and China, I think it's more of signaling because when you speak with the Russians, there are genuine concerns about uh, what the Chinese are doing in Siberia. And also Russia is increasingly looking towards Japan. Putin and Abe have had something like seven or eight meetings, and Russia looks to diversify its economic dependence on China by looking at Vietnam and also at, uh, towards Japan and looking at investment from Japan. So I think Russia is aware of the consequences, but as was mentioned, the West needs to take 
you know, uh, cognizance of the fact that Russia should not be pushed closer into China's, uh, you know, uh, economically and should not become dependent on uh, China, which seems to be happening, especially since 2014. Uh, coming, you know, like for India, Russia, India and China, uh, we've had the RIC mechanism, the dialogue. And what has happened there is a subtle pressure on India to recognize, you know, or to give recognition to China's Belt and Road Initiative. This is something which India sees as a strategic threat. And so for India, that becomes the real challenge. And not just the BRI, which is going to go through Europe and Central Asia, which is something which, you know, gets countries into a debt trap. Uh, but the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the part of the BRI which passes through disputed Indian territory, there is an increasing Russian discourse that India should accept that in the larger interest of development of the neighborhood. Now that becomes a concern for India. And also uh, Russia played a role in getting India into the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. So we feel that that could become another uh, platform where Russia would, you know, try to align India's interests with China overall, it's, uh, you know, given its overall interests. Thomas, why don't you try to respond to the second thing? And let's try to be brief so we get a bunch more questions. I, I think Quentin's uh, uh, sense here is, is very obvious that this might be a sort of movement going on. Does that, doesn't that drive Europe into Russia's arms? Well, let me answer on two levels. First on the Iran level, then directly on the Russia level. Uh, I'm not, uh, the, the, the US violation of the uh, Iran uh, agreement and the inability of Europe to find leverage over the US, and you need to have leverage over the US in order to maintain it and to resist uh, the global reach, the illegal global reach of secondary sanctions, Europe has found out it doesn't have that. There is very little you can, you can do there. It is also questionable, uh, I, I would even doubt uh, whether, um, um, whether your assessment can, can actually come true. Um, because of domestic, uh, domestic developments in Iran. I see no way of Mr. Rouhani and the so-called moderates uh, um, um, uh, sustaining their position uh, under the conditions as they are unfolding today. So does Europe want to be in, uh, find itself uh, trying to maintain an agreement with a radical or radicalizing Iranian uh, regime, uh, maybe led by somebody else. So I'd see the rather the likelihood that Europe is not going to be able to respond to the U.S. because of lack of leverage, and it will, on the long term, doesn't want to do so because it doesn't want to be in the uh, so, sort of in, in the wrong camp in the long run. So I don't uh, I don't see it on the Iran front, but I do see it on the larger question, of course. Uh, so, so, uh, Trump's policy is, is stoking the flames of nationalism in European countries. Yeah, we, the, the idea of a powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this, uh, this type of treatment is setting in in a number of European, uh, in a number of European countries. But here again, you're coming to the same, you're coming to, you will be coming to the same conclusion. Yes, there may be tactical movements of uh, balancing Russia with the U.S., but you have to keep in mind the fundamental strategic interest. And that is not, in, in, in terms of my country, in, in, a, in a Rapallo Germany, but in a Western Germany. Any type of, of, of balancing the U.S. with Russia will create inner European uh, uh, divisions of sorts. Uh, that's a no-go zone. Uh, Western integration is always a dual, a double integration. So you, uh, so you can't sort of, so to say, heal the Trump problem uh, with Putin without, uh, uh, without um, undermining your own interest and undermining European, uh, European unity. So the, uh, 
Putin is no way out. There is no, uh, I mean, uh, and also, by the way, there is Putin. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. It, and, and of course, there's also the fascinating attraction of European populists to Putin, which is a whole other topic. Let's get a bunch of questions here. Um, Jill, did, did uh, okay, Michael, please, and then, We'll just gather some questions and, 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 and then come back. Please go. Yeah, ahead. thanks. Uh, I'm Mike Haltzel from Johns Hopkins Science. Tom actually addressed a little bit about what I wanted to ask. In response to Sandy, you said that it would be a tough sell uh, in Europe to compartmentalize because of things like Abu Ghraib and, and, and uh, Guantanamo. That's a fair point, but I think it's also fair to say that uh, values-wise, despite lapses, I think any rational person would have to say that we have more in common with each other, Europe and the United States, than we do with any other part of the world. And of course, Putin and Xi are just examples of that. But I would, and to say nothing of, of mutual investment in each other, on the ground, euros and dollars, just a huge glue between the continents. What I wanted to say, though, it seems to me that your point, though well taken, could also apply to Europe. I mean, I think that, that um, to believe in the EU's future, you have to compartmentalize. I mean, until now, basically, uh, there's been illiberal behavior, which has been responded to by, by Brussels with a rap on the knuckles and not much more. And so, I mean, it seems to me that selling compartmentalization of the EU is gonna be difficult uh, in, in several, at least in several Western and Northern European countries. Great, thanks. Brian, please, and then here, and then. Thank you, Brian Whitmore, Center for European Policy Analysis. I wanted to pick up on some of Thomas Klein Brokhoff's comments about how we're moving toward a multi-ordered world. I like that formulation. I think that's largely accurate. We're, we're, we're increasingly seeing two normative systems competing with each other on the Eurasian landmass. My question is, where does that leave countries like Ukraine and Georgia, where you have a growing consensus in both society and among the elite, that they would like to join our normative system or our part of this multi-ordered world. Can they be brought into the, the, the Western family, if you will? And if so, how? I'd also would like to hear Ambassador Virchbaugh's comments on this as well. Okay, let's go over there and then, sorry. No, he's got one. Could we bring it back here? Sorry, there. But Hi. Go, but go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Mark Mullen from uh, Transparency International. Um, my question is the connection between the, uh, the, the U.S. Um, abandoning the, the Iran deal and its connection with, with, uh, with North Korea. Um, so if the, the, the North Koreans are looking at this and looking at uh, um, you know, what you say that maybe Trump is going to, to uh, negotiate uh, on his own, come up with his own deal, you know, they're looking at... Um, Trump having, having left uh, the Iran deal and what that means for, for uh, U.S. relations with Europe, what he said about, uh, about um, NAFTA, you know, perhaps as a property developer, you know, how he dealt with his, uh, his, his contractors. Um, it's natural that they could presume that what he's looking for right now is a, some sort of a public relations event. Um, and so I'm wondering, for the sort of Republican establishment, um, of which the, the the Heritage Foundation is a is, is a part, um, the Republican Party policymakers within the Republican Party, how how do they look at this uh, the, the the PR aspect of this? What are the dangers there? What um, you know what 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 could happen? Bringing this into the topic of the long term perspective. Um, what does this mean? Are the are the dangers of going into a North Korean um, uh, deal without a without a deal? Thank you, Mark. Teresa, go ahead. Teresa Fallon, Center for Russia Europe Asia Studies. I have a question for Harinder Sakon to follow up on Quentin's question. You made an interesting point that. Um, about India joining the SCO, because many analysts saw it as a way of Rus for Russia to kind of water it down. But you see it as a way of kind of marshalling um, India's kind of flipping sides and kind of marshalling India into China's greater sphere. So we've seen this recently with talks on the Belt and Road Initiative, which you mentioned. So, you know, we've talked about Russia, frenemies, friends with benefits, the Russia-China box. But with India, it's a whole different situation. And I think that might be 
give, a, uh, give us a deeper understanding of what's going on with Russia and China. So maybe you could comment on that. And the other point I want to ask you about is ASEAN centrality. You mentioned that, but it seems ASEAN centrality, it's not going to happen. And it's very, very divided. And I was recently in China at a conference and they put the EU and ASEAN together into this basket, like, okay, we've got you under control and we don't really need to worry about you anymore. And China has, um, in, you know, taken, Huawei has the, the um, has all of the telecommunications in India. So China, India hasn't really maybe been minding the shop. We saw with Hambon Tata in Sri Lanka, the Maldives, you know, India is losing a great deal of influence right in their strategic neighborhood. So how do you expect India to kind of up their game? Thanks. Okay, great. That's a good range of questions. There's one more gentleman back there, and 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 then we'll go back to the panel. Hello. Uh, conclude. Please. Uh, Owen McNamara. I, I teach here at the University of Tartu at the Johann Schütte uh, Institute of Political Studies. Uh, just an interesting point that was that was raised uh, by the gentleman sitting beside me here and 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 myself. Uh, is what about, about, about the European Union in Asia? The European Union is the largest economy of the world, uh, and there hasn't been too much discussion of, of the European Union as a player. Is, is, is the idea of, of the European Union's own uh, pivot to Asia or a kind of a point-to-point uh, agreement with the different states in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, is, is this feasible and, and what might the views be from, from states within the region, from China, from Pakistan, from, from India, uh, etc. So I would address that, that point to the lady beside you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so just to keep on time, we've got about five minutes, so about a two, three minutes each. Um, and um, it's a good range of questions. I think Everyone will have something to say in their own area. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wanted to just, um, you know, there is, I lay out what the concerns are about the Iran nuclear deal and the reasons the United States pulled out of it. I don't think that's been brought up. And I, we haven't met yet, but I, I do agree with your characterization of the regime. We could get something worse, but it's pretty darn bad right now in Iran. When you look at Syria, you look at Yemen, you look at the support of terrorism. Pulling out uh, accelerates that process. We don't know that but it's already pretty bad. So it looked like you were attacking more of the United States than you were the Iranian regime. Uh, but there's concerns about this, uh, this, and we can talk more about that later, but just in fairness. Uh, there's, there's tremendous concern about the Iranian ability to uh, continue advanced centrifuge research um, throughout, the, throughout, this, uh, throughout this agreement. There's concerns about access to undeclared sites, um, where, for, in particular, military sites where Iran may be doing uh, research or development. I mean, many of us saw the North Korean agreement, the 1994 agreement, and we found out that North Korea was cheating on it uh, after a number of years and a significant transfer of, of benefits, and that's where we are today. It also has sunset provisions. Most of the major provisions that prevent Iran from moving towards a nuclear weapons state expire 10 to 15 years, which is actually 7 to 12 years from now. Um, the ballistic missile program is not included in that at all. The Iran, even under the UN Security Council measures, there seems to be more a lack of enforcement on that, more of an encouragement, but no strict uh, issues. And it certainly should have been included, in my view, in, the, in, the, in this agreement. And of course, Iran's international activity. There was a belief, uh, and I think this was uh, proposed by the previous administration that struck this deal, that Iran's international activity would improve. Uh, it, it would be a better a more responsible stakeholder in the international community. And we're not seeing that by their support of this, the, the Assad regime, uh, terrorism, or what they're, doing, what they're doing in Yemen. And of course, the money flows to Iran. As Iran is integrated into the international community, uh, it, more money flows into its pockets. And then their activities, their troublesome activities are funded. The money that was transferred to Iran was expected to be put, given to, for infrastructure purposes, to improve the lives of everyday Iranians, and it's not been. It's been towards this military buildup and its international adventurism. So that's one of the reasons uh, you know, that I think people are concerned in the United States. I just want to lay those. Some people are concerned about it. And I think Europeans could have done more to step up to get Iran back to the table. And I still think that's a possibility. So laying this just at the feet of the United States, the president gave plenty of time, well, I wouldn't say a significant amount of time for, for Europe to step up and to get Iran back to the table. So, the concerns about secondary sanctions, these are not new. These were, these were, already, these were already known. I don't think that the possibility has been foreclosed, but this is, since you have better relations with Iran than we do, that, to bring okay. them back to the table to get a more comprehensive agreement. And I think this sends the same signal to North Korea, that if we don't get a comprehensive agreement that meets our needs, we're not going to cut one. 
So I'm, I'm not really worried about uh, North Korea's views towards, uh, towards this. I'll stop there. Uh, okay, great. Thomas, do you want to respond to that and just respond first? Tempted to respond on the on, on the Iran thing. I'm not in the interest of time, and uh, not, not going to do that. Uh, not going to do this here. We'll take this uh, outside the room here. Um, <laughs> you want you want a response? <laughs> okay. No, I want to I want to respond to the compartmentalization uh, a, a question that was that was raised. I think that's a fair. That's a very fair uh, a, a question uh, to ask that, that you asked. Um, if you think of a weakening international system uh, that has that, that has a less deep inter layers of integration, you would also have to think the same about uh, about Europe, because we're uh, we're getting to a point where you can think of two directions that Europe will take. It will either remain to be a sort of a values-based community based on Copenhagen criteria and all the rest. That would, that would mean enforcing Article 7 uh, democracy provisions. Or it is going to be an interest-based uh, organization that has a free trade zone and security interests in common, but cares less about the domestic, uh, uh, the constitutional and domestic behavior of, uh, uh, of its members, then it will accept uh, the violations of basic divisions of powers in Poland or, uh, or infringement in, uh, on, on the rules of democracy in Hungary uh, and, and possibly in other countries in the interest of keeping together. So I think that choice is, is, is before us, uh, and my guess would be uh, that because of the dangers of a domino effect of disintegration, that uh, European countries would lean toward the more realist approach. Uh, I'll be very brief too, because I've got a range of questions. Uh, I'll start off with, you know, you've put up a whole lot of questions, we can carry on the discussion later, but I'll start off with the Indian Ocean region and you mentioned how does India uh, plan to rise to the occasion. When it comes to the Indian Ocean, India never ceded its interests over there. India has always maintained a maritime uh, presence in the Indian Ocean. We have our Lakshadweep Islands and, uh, uh, you know, so we have maintained naval bases over there. Uh, in fact, uh, India is one of the founding members of the IORA, Indian Ocean Rim Association. And here we do a lot of work with France, you know, like uh, uh, piracy, uh, Somalian piracy, etc. Uh, India has recently been looking towards uh, the Pacific, and uh, this started uh, maybe about 15 years ago, and the US was the one where we started doing the Malabar exercises. Increasingly now we do a trilateral with Japan, US, US and India, uh, and right now there is one maritime exercise on at the moment uh, in the Pacific. So it's not that uh, these are new initiatives. India is a very strong maritime presence because we have a long coastline to guard. And also we've got uh, interests in the Maldives. We do, so we are taking care of it and we've got a bilateral strong relations with Sri Lanka, with Maldives, etc. Uh, when it comes to uh, Asia, Asia centrality, and I think that is what uh, this young boy also raised the question of Asia. Uh, Asia? Professor. Oh, he's a professor. <laughs> he's younger than me. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, when it comes to Asia, um, Asia is one of the biggest, you know, you cannot try to come up with. Uh, any settlement or any, uh, you know, outside, you know, that, okay, this is what we need to do in the Indo-Pacific, because the ASEA countries are 10 important countries of this area. Uh, ASEA is something like EU. Some countries play a more dominant role, uh, like uh, Vietnam and uh, Indonesia are more uh, eminent and they're the bigger, uh, bigger economies. It's like Germany and France and EU. Some of the smaller countries, but Asia is beginning to realize, and India 
invited ASEAN, you know, there were 10 ASEAN heads of state in New Delhi for our Republic Day uh, celebrations this year, on 26 January of this year. And we had the ASEAN summit, and it was the leaders, the presidents or the prime ministers, not the lower down. And there is a uh, recognition that they need to uh, be more economically integrated to take on the China challenge, because otherwise China has this tendency to make them dependent and divide them uh, individually. And this is what Europe needs to guard against, because the, uh, you know, the Chinese inroads through the Belt and Road into Europe is going to have these uh, ramifications, what I mentioned in my presentation, maybe two decades down the road. Uh, about Russia, I've already spoken. Uh, you know, India and Russia bilaterally, we have no problems. But when we meet in a multilateral mechanism like the Russia, India, China, that is where there is subtle pressure on India to kind of be more accommodating of what China wants to achieve in, on India's neighborhood. And that becomes more of a diplomatic challenge, nothing else. Uh, have I? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great, thanks. Sandy, the last yeah. word is yours. Okay. Uh, First, on uh, Brian Whitmore's question, uh, obviously we have to uh, do everything we can to defend uh, Ukraine and Georgia's uh, right to look to the West to join our system. Uh, I think the EU should uh, think hard about uh, at least offering a distant membership perspe perspective to these countries, even if uh, there's more that they can, they can do under the association agreements and joining the energy union and the digital union, all these things. But ultimately, a membership perspective should be offered. At the same time, we need to put more pressure on Russia to get them to negotiate seriously on getting out of the Donbass, which could uh, at least stabilize the situation. It would leave, leave Crimea still as a long-term uh, problem, you know, like with the occup illegal occupation of the Baltic states, subject to an, a long-term non-recognition policy. But I think to increase the pressure on Russia, Europe needs to not just praise themselves, pat themselves on the back for renewing the sanctions every six months, but think about tightening the sanctions. Four years after the occupation of Donbass, uh, it's clear that Russia is not feeling uh, sufficient pressure to get serious about uh, a peacekeeping force or whatever it would take to implement the Minsk agreements. So you know, the U.S., despite President Trump's initial inclinations to get rid of all the sanctions has tightened them, has targeted Putin's cronies. Uh, you know, we don't have any silver bullet on what's going to change Putin's calculus, but clearly more European pressure through sanctions uh, would make a difference. Also, uh, right now, uh, Hungary is blocking efforts to deeper, deepen Ukraine's integration with NATO short of membership by having a NATO-Ukraine summit meeting in Brussels in, in, uh, in July and uh, you know, granting some additional partnership status to Ukraine. I mean, this is ultimately a European problem to rein in Hungary, and, uh, but everybody's looking to Washington to do this. I don't think uh, I mean, the U.S. has the magic wand by itself to persuade Hungary to delink uh, this issue. Uh, just a, a couple words on, uh, uh, on North Korea. Uh, in response to Mark, uh, Mark's point, from, I think that uh, the administration likes to say that pulling out of the Iran deal is sort of sending a warning to Kim Jong-un that, you know, we're not going to accept a flimsy deal, which I don't think the Iran deal was a flimsy deal in terms of its verification and uh, the constraints it put on uh, Iran's enrichment, at least until the sunset clauses kicked in. And we did have seven more years to work with our European allies to, to, to fix the problems. Uh, or at least, at least maybe one more year. Uh, but I think this puts Trump in a dilemma now because he's, in my view, uh, not going to get uh, a comprehensive, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization, at least not on terms that we can live with. I mean, North Korea will, as you said earlier, demand constraints on U.S. Uh, nuclear deployments in the Asia-Pacific theater. They may want to even abolish the ROK-U.S. alliance. There's a lot of things they could ask for. So I don't expect in the next uh, two weeks we're going to agree on, you know, CVID, but particularly the verification part of this. You know, we would be lucky to get half as good a verification regime with North Korea as we got with Iran. Um, if Trump doesn't, how can he defend this deal? It will be just uh, smoke and mirrors, uh, and maybe he's good at that. <laughs> but I think people begin to look at the fine print and see that this uh, 
the deal is probably a bit uh, bit hollow. I hope not. I hope to, hope that they they have belatedly gotten some experts involved. We've got Sung Kim and other uh, senior officials working for the last few days with the North Korean delegation in uh, in Panmunjom. Uh, so maybe something substantial could be agreed by June 12th, but I think they should not see that date as a uh, as, as a deadline. Uh, the president seems keen to have his photo up, but I think it'd be better to push this thing off until the fall, have a much more prolonged and serious effort to actually hammer out a front-loaded denuclearization deal with at least some verification, rather than have a uh, uh, kind of empty agreement and photo op that would be quickly exposed as a, uh, you know, a very weak outcome for all the hoopla that's being attached to it. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you to the panel for their expertise. Thank you to all of you for your patience. And um, it's over. The mass has ended. We can go. <laughs>